No, no, you don't have to. Okay. I will. Welcome, everybody. We're so glad you're here. Thank you for coming out for this afternoon. Rita and Jeanette and I would like to share with you our experience of preparing our manuscript and some lessons that we have learned. So after today, what we hope that you will be able to do is understand the planning for your own manuscript creation, be able to identify the topics and actions to consider as planning moves forward, and then you will have heard one group's lived experience of manuscript creation, rejection, and resubmission. Now, what I want to tell you is that there are many sources for you once you decide that you want to create a manuscript. Rita and Jeanette and I talked about this, how to approach this. What we would like to do today is to present to you from our two Sigma Theta Tau journals. The Journal of Nursing Scholarship editor is Dr. Susan Granero, and the Worldviews on Evidence-Based Nursing editor is Dr. Bernadette Melnick. They, every time we have Research Congress or we have biennium, they hold a session on helping nurses to prepare to publish. So after we talked, we decided we wanted to bring you what they say, knowing that if you're going to prepare a manuscript, there will be other resources for you. But these are the guys, these are the editors of the top-notch journals of Sigma Theta Tau. So we're going to stick to what they say today. I have given you the link to their presentation, which is housed on the Virginia Henderson Virtual Library. So if you get away from here today and you want to go and see what they have said, that is available to you. In addition to that, you will find textbooks or books for successful hints on how to become published. So this is what we're going to go through today. When you get started, typically it's some topic that you're passionate about. When Rita and Jeanette get up here to present in a moment, you will see how passionate they are about this topic. Typically the authors are very passionate about what they want to present. So the thing that you want to do is you keep a creative file of things that you might want to publish about. If you happen to be a participant in a research study, then that would be what you want to prepare to present. Our graduate research students, some of many of them are here today, they are in the process of preparing an integrated research review, which could be moved into a manuscript and published. Think about how this will fit into your career portfolio, especially if you're in academics. Do you, are you required to publish? Or is this something that you just have a personal goal to set this? And then you might consider the Institute for Science Information ranking if that would be important for your career. And every slide there on your handout has the link to help you to get to this information. So you plan the manuscript, you think about your audience, who would you like to get this message to? And then you go to those variety of journals and you submit for what are the manuscript requirements of this journal. They're going to tell you specifically how you prepare your manuscript. How many words can you use? How do you set up your headings? How do you have um, tables? pictures, whatever it is that you want to include, they're going to give you the instruction of how to do that. You want to think about what is my main message? What did I do? Did you conduct a research study? What did you do? How did you do it? What did you find? And finally, what are the implications? You create an outline. And this is a standardized outline for a research. Yours might be a little bit different than this. Rita and Jeanette and I did not do a, conduct a research study. I would say that we did a very specific review of the literature. We are writing a feature article submitted to the Amer American Journal of Nursing on what the lived experiences of these two nurses have been. All right? So this would give you a standardized framework that these might be your headings 
for your manuscript. Finally, common issues, why you might choose not to do it. Is your topic done to death? You know, your publisher might say, we have published on this multiple times. We're not interested to publish on it again. If you do not follow the editor or the journal's guidelines, they will reject your manuscript. It's too esoteric. It's too left of the field. The fit or the timing, if your manuscript is way too long or way too short, they're going to give you the range, the limited number of words that you can use. So if you only have 3,000 words, that's all you can use, all right? Setting within a broader context, it might be an international context and this might be a smaller context readership. These are all problems. And then the author and the authorship is not clear. We've had to be very specific on who are the authors. Rita's, it was Rita's idea. Rita did a bunch of the work. She's first author. Jeanette did a lot of the research finding the latest articles. She's second author. And then I was there to help and give ideas and help to orchestrate it. So I'm third author on this publication. Those things are negotiable, but what you want to know is that the first author typically does the majority or the bulk of the work may have had the major idea. And sometimes these first and second authors are negotiable. But you, if you have done the majority of the work, you have the right to say, I feel that I should be first author on this publication. All right? Now, here's your writing team. Who is your writing team? Who is it all? You have all read articles that have five, six, seven authors. Who is your writing team? What are the responsibilities of each one that is writing? There we were just talking about authorship. First, second, and third author is negotiable. You talk about that. You advocate for that. I've done the work. I think I should be first author. I want to be first author. What are everyone's expectations? We were very clear with that and talked to each other as we worked through this. Find you a mentor, a writing buddy, someone that you can trust and will provide you with honest. We were very honest with each other, weren't we? We really did this well. Uh, a published writer. Look across different journals and note different styles, aims, and approaches. So let's just say you don't wanted to write a feature article. I would go to that journal and I would look at the stylistic, the headings, the formatting for a feature article because they're going to give me that instruction, but I want to pattern my manuscript after what's been published. Does that make sense? You bet. All right, pitfalls. Titles that don't match the articles. You know, the, all, the reviewers may read your title and then they get into the manuscript and they're like, well, this isn't really matching what the title says. That could be a problem. Structured, two structured abstracts. Literature reviews that don't lead you to why you did the study or they lack rigor or they're old. Old references to the literature, all right? Uh, lack of information about what you did and how you did it goes to trustworthiness and the rigor, validity and reliability of your tools if you used a tool. We don't have a tool with our study, but the validity and the reliability of the survey tools that you use in your study would need to be, it's very important to report. There's also guidelines I, I uh, told you about tables and figures. They tell you specifically how to do that. And then your discussion does not relate to your findings, and there's what I told you. References are old, incomplete, or not in the right format. In nursing, typically, we write in APA format. That's what I would expect that your journal would request. But you would want to be sure of that if APA format is the format that they want. The peer review process. All right. Our first manuscript was sent to peer reviewers. We received feedback from three peer reviewers, all right? That they are looking to see if we followed the guidelines and our, uh, if we don't, then we risk our manuscript being returned. What is involved in the peer review process? We sent our manuscript to the editor and she gave it to three peer reviewers in a blind study. They did not know our names, but they were reading our manuscript. 
They have a typical review criteria that would be based on what type of article that you were submitting for. And then the possible outcomes of the review process, I'll talk about that more in a little bit. And then the typical reasons for revision and then strategies for resubmission. We'll go over that in just a minute because there's some more detail. Well, what can happen with your manuscript? It can be accepted. Cool. All right, it could be that they say you need to revise it and resubmit, and that's what's happened with us. We got excellent feedback from our three reviewers, and we went over that in detail, and we fixed those things. That's a good West Texas word, isn't it? We fixed it. We fixed those things that our reviewers were critical of with our manuscript. All right, typical reasons that you could be rejected, it's the content's not new. The story's been told. We felt like our story was new, okay? So we felt that it, it should be published. Maybe the content is too narrow, too specialized, or not specialized enough for the readership. You have to think about who is going to be reading this journal, and the manuscript needs to fit for those readers. Our writing style is not clear. That could be a fatal flaw. You want to read that aloud, and you want your reader to be able to follow your flow of thought. It's very important. Poor writing and then logic and flow. Reasons for rejection. You know, what I told you at the very beginning is that you look at the journal and what type of articles do they publish. If you don't pay attention to that, you could be rejected because what you're saying doesn't fit with the journal, okay? Poor evidence or a poor literature review could be a problem. Inadequate description, lacking an international perspective, if it needs to be an international perspective, okay? Publication duplication, has this been already published on? Redundant, questionable contribution. Remember, very few papers are accepted without revisions, okay? That's just it, most people have to revise. And many well-written papers are rejected because the content and focus would be better suited for another journal. These are things that Dr. Melnick and Dr. Gennaro are telling us, all righty? <laughs> Here's some more reasons for rejection. Too much information, too little information, inaccurate information, it's disorganized, or you have structural problems. Do you like my little monkey? I tell you that's how some of authors feel. They didn't like my work. Or, you know, I just don't have time to make another revision to this manuscript. Or, this process is wearing me out. So I went through that pretty quickly just because you have access to that even after we leave today. I really wanted to get to the lived experience that the three of us went through. So I'm going to turn this over now, give us a moment to switch the mic, and Rita's going to come, and she's going to talk about her story. It's okay, it's okay. Then I'll no, go. I want you to have it first. Because I'll have to start my Can vision. Just back it up right quick. There you go. There you go. Okay. My name is Rita, and I've been working at the Covenant Health System for the last 18 years. And my major of my experience is, I would say, 35 plus years in supervisory position, administration clinical nursing in intensive care unit, med surgery unit, oncology. And last, I worked in was my stem cell unit. I have two certification. One is in general oncology, and the other one is in bone marrow transplant. Also, I'm a student of LCO for my graduate. And if this wonderful ladies had not worked with me, I don't think I would be confident enough today to start publishing a manuscript. Okay, my journey starts with the vision. Let's go to the vision. Go? Yeah. Then I can. My vision is to improve and promote safety in nursing practice, resulting in zero harm. 
and improving patient outcomes, building healthier community, which impacts daily actions and clarity and honesty to my life's purpose and fueling my passion for culture of safety. Now, how did I begin this? Three years ago, when I was given an opportunity from stem cell transplant unit to the infection prevention department, we had start a CORTI project, that is catheter-associated urinary tract infection. We started it as a research project with our, my former director, Carrie Love, and she moved, went on moving forward. So then I took it as a performance improvement. This we started with a team of group people and started with the emergency department, critical care areas like MI, CICU, and um, SICU. Now, what did I do? To have a pre point prevalence study, we developed a tool. And with that tool, I started auditing these four uh, places. And in, my tool was just yes or no. When I saw these responses, when I audit was everything no, I developed a more passion to it. I was not mad, I was not angry. I sat with my boss and I said, we need to do something about it. And how much are we going to keep uh, giving our reports to the National Health Safety for the health, um, hospital associated infections? She said, yes, what can we do? It's a basic thing of inserting catheters. I said, yes. So we went and started educating emergency department nurses, all the critical care area nurses, including even the nurse aides, created a Foley bundle. And we focused on aseptic insertions and also the criteria for insertion and maintenance and care. The nurse, the the report what I got from nurses multiple times, Rita, we have done this. I said, yes, I have done it too. But when I pulled out the evidence-based practices, I had no answer to myself. How much harm have I done by doing those simple mistakes? Which is not a purposefully I did it, but I was not aware of it. It's a knowledge deficit gap or our practical practice of gap. So we did the competency checkup on one-on-one -on -one with every nurse, licensed staff, and maintenance and care was done with our nurse aid. My more passion developed for more better outcome. In two months later, from the emergency department nurses, from 95%, the catheter insertion rate was dropped to 60%. Because every Tom, Dick, and Harry who came there, catheters were inserted for convenience. When we dig this out, we are the nurses said, oh, yes, no, we are not putting. But even till today, I audit every day where the catheters are inserted, and I look for the criteria. So that was another thing. Secondly, I thought when this passion came, I spoke to my boss, and I said, we need to do something. I want to start writing a publication. So she said, how are we are going to do this? I said, this is my vision. This is what I have got to do. It's a global challenge. It's not only in our hospital. It's not the way how we practice, because it is everywhere. And in 2017, American Nurses Society declared the year of culture of safety for nurses. And I was reading all the journals right from the beginning. Also, I said to myself, and I said, I need to do now some brainstorming. Went to the, before I could even choose my co-authors, I went to the library, did a lot of, lot of research on evidence-based practice. And I had more than, I would say, 200 articles on evidence-based, anywhere from 2007 till 2012 or 13. And I put that all together, highlighted it, and I said to myself, now I need a co-author. Who could be my co-author? I thought about it, thought about it, did not approach anyone. Then one day, casually, I mentioned to Jeanette, because she has the same experience like me. 
and our, we have the same cultural background in our patient care. I said, why don't I talk to her? And I know Jeanette was going through a rough phase of her life. And I said, Jeanette, let's do it. She looked at me. She looked at me, what? I said, yeah. I said, I'll do the work. I will find out everything. But I just need a co-author for more information, for their, um, their ide her ideas, her thoughts, or whatever she thinks. That was in my mind. Then I wanted a mentor and another co-worker. And here the one who is on my right side now, <laughs> Dr. Ford, I sent her an email. I said, will you be with us? She said, yes, at any time. And the confidence that gave me when she accepted it was I was her student. And I know how I wrote my research paper, how she corrected it. <laughs> but here on our manuscript, Dr. Ford had given us a lot of feedback. We met almost every week once during our first few months. And of course, sometimes we were not able to do because of our timings. But in the second time, as the time came by for publishing it, we met more often. There was a time even we met twice a week. So it went on and on. Then let's go to the back one slide. Yeah. Now, this is the observed data. which prompted my passion. Now, as per the, our facility organization, National Health Safety, for 2015, they predicted the rate as 15.9. And actual was 18. The CORTI standard infection ratio for 2017 was 1.13. Now, 2017, the predicted rate was 18.44. Actual was 16. And CORTI information, uh, standard information ratio was 0 0.86. Can we see little improvement? Yes, that makes me feel good. And also being in medical ICU, they have the highest mortality rate in the nation as per the evidence-based practice. But this unit went, 2017, they went for six months with zero cortis. They did, the nurses did perfectly from A to Z what was supposed to be done, including the criteria that the patient needed and also the bundle they followed, including care and maintenance and documentation. CICU unit, they had zero cortis for four consecutive months and SICU was three months. Now we have implemented further for all the step down and med surge unit. We continue doing our regular round and that's the passion for the safety culture I'm building in every day by reminding them day to day, no, that's not right, this is not right. This is the way how we have to do it. It is a challenge, but I, I don't know when we will get that 100%, it may not be. But things are coming to that standstill. And when I see this improvement, I have a lot of satisfaction in the work that I do compared to my vision. Any other slide up with this? Yep. So now I will hand over to Janet, my co-author, and how much she has brainstormed to this. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jeanette Pia. I'm a clinical instructor in Covenant School of Nursing. Uh, my long experience is in surgical ICU. I have a long years being a nursing administrator, not here, back home, and long years of being a staff nurse. So I've been on that role. So I know what are the expectations from each role I have. Okay, we started, why did I join the bandwagon? with Rita Krasta. Uh, we worked together in stem cell and oncology floor as the ICU. They usually called me or called the ICU nurses to help them on stem cell. She talked to me, but before that, uh, every time I have a student in SI, I felt 
that this student, before they start their, as an RN or a GN, should be educated about the COTI. So I will ask Rita, can you speak to my student for 15 minutes during the post conference? So she was there every Tuesday with me and teach about the COTI. And I think it has a great effect on the nurses that came in as a new RN. It's, um, I believe, being that in different role, I have a thinking of synergistic. They should work together. Right now, I am in, I am eight. I could see the role of the staff nurse, the student, and the clinical instructor. Okay, so in these three staff working together can help on the quality of care. So that way I was convinced to work with Rita Crasta, with the paper, with a little bit of anxiety <laughs> because we're so, okay. And my second question, how? How did we do it at first? Um, she pre presented a lot of literature she showed it to me. My role is to read and scrutinize. This is not good. This is good. Then we come out with the title. It's a culture of safety. It's just a lip service. Because my experience is that the hospital provided, all, provided us all the protocols, the standards. But what's going on? What's the, what's the issue? How come the quality of care? And there's a lot of medical errors infections it's the culture each one of us doesn't have that accountability the staff nurse the managers and the top managers it's all personal accountability so we did the brainstorming initial research again try to figure out okay we have to think about and concentrate on the culture because there's a wide range of literature available. 200, we went down 200 to 102 after reading those literature. Then only 49 was cited on our paper. Uh, decided to what? Research, what did I do? What is my contribution? I have said earlier, I did a lot of reading based on the literature that she gave me. And aside from that, I did my own literature. And more, I'm more concentrated on the curriculum. What can I help to improve the curriculum and my teaching to the student about quality of care? I strongly believe the start of quality care starts with the student. Because if the student has a good foundation about quality care, safety, I bet those culture will be carried out. Um, I did a lot of editing, especially on the reference. We were given a task by Dr. Ford, help us. Okay, Jeanette, you'll do the introduction. Uh, research more on accountability. Research more on communication. So we know our task. We know where we're heading to. We're not like, okay, what's the next one? It's, everything is well directed. That's why it's very important to have a mentor. It's very important. When, after several meetings and reviewed a lot of literature, the group decided to put emphasis on organizational and individual accountability. That's the key areas that we're able to identify. Proactive attitudes of compliance. We believe it's not, not your role it's my role to observe quality of care. Okay, communication. We have, you know, the hierarchy. Sometimes it's only down, there's no up, there's no. So communication start from the bottom, the nurses, to your peers, to your coworkers, to your managers, and up to. Communication is very important. So we concentrate on the three areas. And we come out with the solutions or recommendations on three areas. So it's easy. The guidance of Dr. Ford really 
she gave us the focus, okay, which one do you want, okay, which one, because there's a lot, we have to concentrate only on few items, and it helps a lot if you have a mentor, or else we'll be going like a cat, roaming around. Okay, what's my take home with this experience? Patience. A lot of patience because we're working. Aside from this, we're working. So patience and passion. I told passion because if you will see the time that we spend, the three of us, aside from meeting, the time spent each day is, I should be rich because of the time spent. Also, being inquisitive. The Okay, what's this? It doesn't make sense. So I tend to ask questions. I ask questions to, to read across. Uh, what do you think? This is the one I'm thinking. So if you have that thinking, the more you dig up literatures. You ask questions like a child. What happened? How? How can I do it? When? So those are the questions. And again, time management, what I've learned because you work eight hours a day, and this is additional work. But I'm telling you guys, it's a good journey. It helps me to improve my teaching. It helps me to push what is important to the student. And right now in IM8, I'm teaching QI. I included, I really spend time teaching them about quality, safe and security. And I'm doing the NCLEX review Every week with a student, I make sure I included safety and security and quality care. And it's a good thing you, with my experience in a clinical, I can help the student. This is what happened. So what do you think? So those are the take home for me that I will not forget. And way back before I started doing research with Dr. Long about end of life, but life happens. My interest was gone because my husband passed away. But I started that road, did I stop it? This time I didn't stop, I pursued it because everybody will benefit. It's not the person who's reading, I'm benefit first. I got the benefit first and my student got the benefits. Thank you. Oh, like this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Come on. Um, our reviewer's comments were, first they said when this, we started, when we wrote it, this, it was started with a very excellent comment. But as the narrative went down, uh, they said there was some evidence what they felt was not very appropriate about the, yeah. Yes, general, unclear, and it lacks details. Um, I wondered why and how they, were, they questioned us. So we sat all of us, read the whole article. For me, in my views, after doing so much of the research on evidence-based literature, I thought it was perfect. And I said, who are the reviewers who wrote these comments? You know, that opened my eyes more. So how and who. So went back again, we changed everything, and Dr. Ford gave us the feedback, let's try doing this. Let's put all those things together and write again a call for action. And we formed those all three, initially what we said on accountability, proactive attitudes, and communication. These are the things we gave the specific narratives. We did not mention scenarios. We gave everything and looked around for the call of action, created it, wrote a small abstract on it. That was what they wanted for the latest uh, edition of the publication. Incorporation of safety competences into nursing curriculum. Okay. Because on the previous manuscript, we stated that 
there is a role between the clinical instructor, the student, and the nurses. And usually, errors happen on the floor. And the peer review said, I've been a nurse for a long time, but it's still the same problem. So what will be your action about it? What will you do? Exactly, that's the statement of the peer reviewer. Okay, so what I did is I researched and able to get the latest and the current article about the role of this clinical instructor, the staff nurse, and the student. And able to identify studies that tells us, that provide us information that the role of the student in keeping the nurses to be aware of the quality and safety is very important. Because this student came fresh. They know the standard. Okay. Then they say, and my experience too, I had experience with that. They say, what I have learned from school is this, this, this. But Mrs. Pia, that's not the what. That's what, I didn't see that from my nurse. So that was based on my experience and based on the study conducted. So we were able to get an article that proved that education and changing of the curriculum helps on the quality of care. And also going back to the point of regarding empowering nurses, the reviewers asked, how would you empower the nurses? What would you make them to do? My point was, discussion was the communication and accountability. The thing is, and the teamwork. Now, when you say communication, the more is emphasized on the bedside report. And there are still, I asked the nurses, did you get a report on, especially on the quality maintenance this morning? They will look at my face and they will say, oh, we talked about it, it is written on the card desk. But my point is, did you assess it as you assess your central line? The answer was no, they were very honest. Okay, did you collect a urine specimen for culture sensitivity? Yes. How did you do this? Oh, I forgot to use the tubes. We have tubes now for preservatives. It is just because once the lab rejected, the nurses, they don't, carry, they don't have the courage to go and do the tube as they are instructed. They feel discouraged that lab may reject it again and it's a waste of time. So I asked them, what are your roadblocks? not to practice the right way as per our protocols or as per how we have educated you. I said, we all need to step forward and do the right thing to save our time, to save our patient's care. And then they say, yes, things are going into the very right direction, and that's what now we have submitted about the communication during the handout report, and also the transparency in communication. Even if the patient is in the transition of care, there should be a proper communication, either a written communication or a verbal communication when you write down everything, so that we don't miss any point regarding the patient safety issues and the quality of care. So that was one more thing. I think what I would like to say too is you see that Rita has these wonderful real life lived experiences and what then we would do is meet and we would go to the literature to yes. find the answer so it has broad application because we know that we are not the only area that are having these challenges and we wanted it to to meet the needs of more we were thinking of the readership of the american journal of nursing and we wanted it to fit their needs so so yeah. let's do our last slide yes That's a flip. and now that we have submitted again for the second time we are so much excited with the rigidity. When are we going to hear it from them? So it was a very good collaborative experience. But my learning experience in this is never to give up your hopes. Mm -hmm. The more you went back to do it, the more ideas and efforts you will put into it, and you will learn much more. That was the, my passion, and I still have the passion to do something different. You can see her passion. <laughs> We would like to invite Dr. Amanda V. Sart to the podium now to speak. Amanda, Dr. Amanda.
being here. You're welcome. Um, so lessons learned, a couple of things for me as a, a published author. Um, one thing is, why do we publish? That's one thing that we didn't know as nurses. We read articles and they make us read articles and we have to do it in school. And I am a graduate of the BSM program here and I'm not gonna lie, I did not enjoy reading the articles when I first started um, because I was a nurse, that's what I did. And once you realize why you wanna publish and get it out there, it's really important. One, for career driven, right? That's what a lot of us publish because of our careers and we have to, especially in academia. Um, two, Guys, we do this stuff all the time and someone else is owning it for you. Someone else is putting it out there. They're putting their name on it and you go to read an article and you go, we do that all the time. Why didn't I write about that? And so that's probably one of my most frustrating things when I very first started writing. So that's, that's two things is own the things you do that are new and innovative and out there and write about them. Get them out into the public to help us as nurses know that things are changing and things are different. Um, those are big things about publications that we look at. So write it down always. Everyone says, I don't have time to get started. I don't have time to do a manuscript. My first manuscript, the abstract, was written on an airplane coming back from a conference because I was so excited and I was like really kind of frustrated um, about some things that were there that I knew we were doing and we were doing great things with it here at UMC in nursing. And so I wrote the abstract on the airplane. It wasn't the final version, I promise, but I wrote it down. So it gives you a chance to really kind of hone in, bounce ideas off of people, find a collaborator. So just write it down. If you have something in your mind right now that's going on when you're sitting here listening to that, write it down. Five or six sentences and you can tweak it later because those will always come up to, to, uh, to you later. Um, presentations and publications can be done simultaneously or inter, intertwined or one before the other. I was taught always to do a presentation first and then a publication because it's easier. What I found out is I was doing public presentations and then people were publishing my presentations because you're putting your information out there and then they get an idea and then they publish on it. So you can publish first, you can present first, just make sure you're doing it and you're getting your work out there. Make sure that you're putting the time in to do it. If you do a presentation first, it's really easy to take a manuscript off of that. So just keep that in mind if you've already done a, a presentation that you can turn it around into a publication pretty quickly because you've already done the work. Um, when you guys talk about finding the journals, email the editor of the journal. That's one tip that I can give you that I wasn't given and email the editor and just say, I'm thinking about submitting this article. Is it something you're interested in? Um, we actually just did this last week and the editor emailed us back and said, you know, no, this doesn't really fit what we're looking for right now, but this journal is really looking for it and I've included the editor on it. And so they know each other. The nursing world and the editor world and the journal world is very small. And so they know each other. And if they know a, a journal that it'll fit in, they'll, they'll get you in the right direction. The other thing, another experience that I had is I emailed the editor of the journal and I really wanted to write on the research I do with generations of millennials. And I said, I really want to write this article on millennial leaders. And she said, can we have a phone conversation? and came back and said, I really want you to write an article on how you are a leader as a millennial instead of how to change the facilities and how to expect that. And so basically she asked me to write an article for her journal just by that one email. And so it was, it was an easy publication then because you already know they want it, you're writing what they want. So just put that communication out there to your editors ahead of time. They'll tell you if they want that article or not. They'll tell you if they're looking for that in that area. One of the editors told me, I never want to see another article in a flipped classroom ever again because it was so saturated and people were doing it all the time. And so we were looking at doing an article on that. It would have been rejected immediately because she didn't want to see it. She didn't want that in her journal again at that time. So I think that's what goes to saturation. Is that what they're looking for? And so just that communication, most of them respond pretty quickly if you email them. And their email is in the front of a journal. If you guys don't know that, if you open a journal up or you go online, the editor's email is right in the front. So all you have to do is click on it and send the email out to them pretty quickly. Um, I had down here to talk about authorship, but you did talk about that. Make sure that's up front when you start writing an article with other people. Um, who goes first, who goes second, who goes third. You don't want to lose friends or colleagues over um, writing an article and whose name went on it and who was in order. It doesn't matter. A published article is a published article. Whether you're the first author or the last author, you still get credit for it. So just know who's going to do the work. 
Um, talk about a little bit about outlines. So you talked about outlines and journals, and you guys, you have a template now in your in your uh, handout. So know that outlines change for each journal. So don't write. Look at the journal prior to, and then go off your outline. If you have one already ready that she gave you that template, you might have to pull and plug and push and put things in areas that you didn't know were going to fit in different areas. So make sure you look at those outlines before you submit. Um, actually, Terry and I wrote an article together, and uh, a team of us, and Terry was on it, and it got rejected because the title didn't match what we wrote in the article. It wasn't intentional. It was we started with something, and we started with an abstract, and we really didn't go back and reread the title. It was an absolute strong article, and that's what they said is, this doesn't match. So it got rejected. We have to turn it around and fix that title and get it to a different journal. So just little details like that that you forget. Um, done to death is one thing you have in there. So done to death, if it's out there, like I said, flipped classrooms, things like that, things that you're seeing over and over and over again at the conferences, it's probably going to be very difficult to get an a abstract or a publication on it. So make sure that you're putting it out there before someone else does and puts their name on it. Um, the one thing that you talk about in yours is the lack of clarity, lack of what you're talking about in your article, in your comments, if you went back to the comments. So it's the curse of knowledge. Right? It's, that's actually a theory, the curse of knowledge. We have the curse of knowledge. Is we know what we're talking about because you do it every single day. You know what you're talking about because you're, you're, you know Cotties, you know the process, you know the procedure. When you're writing an article, remember that you have the curse of knowledge. So you know it and you think that they should just know what you're talking about and they don't. So you have to explain it in great detail. Like you were talking to your husband or your wife or a boyfriend or a girlfriend that's not in nursing more than likely you're going to get it across better if you write it in that kind of structure than if you do a nursing structure. So you have to know your audience, but you also have to know that you know more than your audience. And so sometimes that can be to your detriment. Um, I'm trying to talk fast. I have enough time? OK. Couple of other tips that I got. Titles. I used to like to re write really catchy titles. And I'm really good at really catchy titles, right? So one of the um, titles that I love is, you know, Challenging the Sacred Cow was one of my articles on what we were doing because there's sacred cows in nursing that you just can't rock. You just can't rock them, and I like to rock them a little bit. And so the, a journal editor wrote back and said, this is a great article, but the title doesn't help us because when you put a title out there, they don't know what the title, they don't know what they're reading. So you guys type in something, right? When you're searching in school, you type in evidence-based practice on Cotties. Well, challenging a sacred cow is not going to pull up. And so one thing they, that they told me was make sure that your title is what your article is about. Plain and simple. It's not fun. It's not glittery. It's not. You can save that for your presentations and your, your posters. But when you're writing the article, make sure that your article conveys exactly or your title conveys exactly what your article is. That way they know, the reader knows, they can type it into a database and they can pull up your article. Also actually helps you get more hits on your article. Um, innovations. So you have innovative briefs, you have just research briefs, and you have research articles. Make sure if you're going to apply to an innovative journal that it's something innovative. We think we do great things and we think we're very innovative and then you start reading in the literature and you're like, oh man, I'm not that innovative. And so make sure if you are doing an innovative article that you're talking about the piece that's innovative. You might do something that we've been doing for 20 years, but you added something to it. That's what you feature in your article if you're featuring an innovation article. Um, it's just a tip that I got that has been very, very helpful because I thought we were pretty innovative in some of the things we were doing, but a lot of people are doing what you're doing to the left and right of you. So make sure you're picking up the pieces that make you really stand out. That's what they want in those articles. Make sure if you're writing a research article that you focus on the research section. That's probably one thing that if, you, if you're writing the literature and you're, you're writing the review and you did 106 different articles but you write about that instead of your actual research, they're going to reject it. Um, and they're going to turn it back to you and say there's not enough emphasis on the research section of this article. Um, make sure your briefs are brief. I know that sounds like 
<laughs> it should be common sense, but when you get to writing and you think 1,500 words and you just keep writing and writing and writing, make sure they're brief. They want briefs to be briefs. They want research articles to be research articles. Um, and it sounds really simple, but when you start writing about something you're passionate about, it's not. Um, if you do get rejections, revise it, resubmit it. You probably will always get revisions. That's what I was told. Mm -hmm. Very rarely are you going to just get accepted exactly how as is. Because it's a person on the other side reading that, and they have a different writing style. So they're going to come back and say, eh, clarify this sentence, edit this sentence, change this. What do you mean by this? Take those as constructive criticism. Also take those as they really like your article. Because if they don't like your article, they're going to reject it and move on to the next. They, they look at a lot of articles. And so when they give those revisions to you, do them. Do them at, you know, how they said. Look at those revisions and resubmit it back to them. The other thing is to do it quickly. Don't sit on your revisions for a long period of time because then they think you're not interested in doing the revisions. Um, just a few tips that I've heard. Um, one thing is offer to be a guest editor. If you're really, really interested in publishing in an article, sometimes you can offer to be a guest editor. And then they start throwing things your way of, hey, can you cover a brief on this? Can you cover a topic article on this? Do you have time to cover a section on Cotties? Because that's coming up in our, next, in, in our next brief. And so when, you, when they know who you are and that you're interested in their journal, they might throw you a bone, so to speak, every once in a while because they need people to write for them. And so two of my articles have been, actually been published on things that I wouldn't say I wasn't an expert in, but I mean, I was an ICU nurse for a long time. I had some experience in the ICU, and they're like, we really need an ICU nurse to write this section. Will you do it? Sure, I'll go pull the literature and do it. I mean, I can do it. I'm not necessarily the expert on it, but they needed someone that, to do it and have a fast turnaround. So if they know your name and you're kind of scratching their back, then they're going to throw you some of those briefs every once in a while, those special edition articles. Um, you guys have experienced that too, right? Um, the last one I think I would tell you is the new push is to replicate studies. And so I was at a conference about three weeks ago, and nursing science is terrible about repeating studies because we've always been told that it should be a new innovative study to be rigorous. But we haven't built a research bank in nursing because of it. And so if you can replicate a study, not replicate an article, replicate a study, that has been done in the past that's there and you can add to the body in the literature, then that is what they're looking for currently. So being up on what they're looking for currently in, in a lot of the articles and um, building that repository that they're talking about of repeat those old studies, look at those um, old research studies and let's get our science, nursing science built back up, um, then you have a really good chance coming up for some publications. So I hope that's what you wanted and an invited response. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Question. Well, I was just wondering if you guys were seeing this because I have in about the past two years and it seems to be a pretty strong trend that it used to be that you could get several people on an article, I mean lots, you know, and have somebody that maybe all they did was just, you know, read the article and that seems to be changing. Many journals now are asking uh, that each author has to estimate how much time they spent, like the percentage of time that you actually put down and what exactly you did. They want to know specifically what you did. You have to put that in when you're uh, giving kind of assurance that it's your work and that it was honest work and that everybody really did contribute. So the days, I think, when you just dragged a whole bunch of people along on your coattail because you were nice, I think they're about gone. I agree. I've cited, I, I, there was actually a presentation on this about how the ethics of writing, um, they're kind of tightening up the ethics of writing because used to, if someone edited your article, just looked at it, they would put their name on the back side right. of it. Um, and that is no longer um, kind of acceptable in the writing world. They have to, you know, guide, if they're, if they're going to be a mentor and edit, they're going to have to guide you on the writing process. They're going to have to tell you how to do it and, and put their time in. So they're asking how much time you're spending um, in your authorship when you fill it out. There's a lot of paperwork that goes in to putting in an article, not just the article. So you guys know the first time you submitted, I was like, holy moly. <laughs> I mean, you have to do cover letters and authorships and conflicts of interest and 
reference pages and it's just, it gets long. It's probably, what, 20 pages long once you finish. But they are asking that in the authorship now of time spent. There's also predatory journals out there. So if you guys haven't heard that term yet, if you're looking at publishing, make sure that you're using a journal that um, meets the ethic guidelines and it's not predatory journals. So you guys know what that means. They're having people pay 900,000s of dollars to get published and they're not actually peer-reviewed journals. They're portraying themselves as peer-reviewed journals on the internet and such. And so there's a whole list. You can type them in and say predatory journals and they'll give you a list of who are predatory journals. So steer away from those guys. They'll take your money. You shouldn't have to pay to publish. Some places you do, but for the most part you shouldn't. They're always looking for articles. Um, but yeah, I know that that's a new push is make sure that the people that helped write it actually helped write it. On that note, I would say that anyone that helped with your projects, make sure you ask them. A lot of people are going to say no, but when I very first started um, in the academic world 10 years ago, believe it or not, Dr. Long, 10 years ago, um, there, were, there was a lot of that going on. There was a lot of people that would go and write an article and they would publish and say, hey, we published this article. And there were about four other people that helped with that project before the article was published. And so make sure you just include anyone that was part of your project. Um, if you present on it and there's four authors on the presentation, just say, hey, we're going to write this up. Do you want to be a part of it? Most people are going to tell you no, but then, then you're ethically OK. You're ethically covering that you included anyone that it was their idea, kind of that copyright thing. So, anything else? Yeah, I have an experience when we published our first, uh, when they rejected it with their numerous comments, when they published it, I saw the difference. First, when it was published, it was just a letter to the editor, and did my PDF and posted it online. Now, this time when I went to publish it, we had a list of pages to do it, and I said, what is this? But I printed out what we needed to submit, and it was all given step by step. Yeah. And I said to Dr. Four, things are different. So <laughs> each one's role I had to write, fill it up, each one's credentials. It was all step by step. It was easy, but then I thought it's a lot of work. It is, it's a lot of work, and it takes a long time to get it back sometimes. Those bigger journals that you're yes. looking at, you know, the American journals, the medicine journals, the AACN journals. I mean, their, their turnaround is, what, three months sometimes before you even hear from them. Mm -hmm. And so if you're on a tight time frame, know that you might not get it back the next week. You're going to sit and wait. Patience is key. I think that's what she, she said is patience is key. Yeah. So, But once you get that first one in, they just roll after that. They just roll. It's a lot of fun. Got it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I really appreciate it. Okay.